Thank you, Dr. Bruzzin. The one thing he didn't mention was I'm his student, so it's always nice to have your, your mentor be able to introduce you. And I, I kind of smiled when John was talking about my, uh, my clients. Obviously, people always want to talk about the White House and, and my 11 years under the Bush, Clinton, Bush administrations. But I think one of the even funnier stories was Fruit of the Loom. Everyone know what Fruit of the Loom is, really? They're an underwear company. And within my contract, I made an agreement that I would get underwear for life for building their fitness center for them. But unfortunately, the guy who was in charge of that part of the contract left before, uh, before it happened. So I got paid. I didn't get underwear for life. <laughs> I'm going to share with you over the next couple of minutes some of the background of what I've done with exercise, health, and fitness. I'm going to talk about the research that I'm doing here at NUIG with John about exercise and how we can use technology to get people to go out and exercise more. And then I'm going to share with you, uh, there are probably 12, 15 mobile fitness apps that I've found, that I've looked at, that I think are really interesting. And if you have an interest in any of this, I definitely recommend that you go out and you try them. A couple pieces of housekeeping notes. If you're a student and you need credit, you need to sign the sheet that's going around. Don't sign in for your friend. John and I will go through, and if their friend's not here, we're going to cross the name off. And my fourth year and third year students know the rule. If you came in late, you're doing push-ups afterwards. Second years, that's what you have to look forward to next year. So fitness, there's an app for that. Give you a little bit of a background, as John mentioned. I work at the Digital Enterprise Research Institute, Derry, as part of, of NUI Galway. I've written uh, four books. I uh, have started, Fitwell was the company that I managed, uh, that John mentioned when I was 24, I started. I took fitness and wellness, put it together, and I got Fitwell. And from there, the, the, the White House was the first client that I had. And people said, how did you land the White House as your first client? And I said, I, I shoot for the stars. And uh, uh, things only have gotten better because now, obviously, I'm here in Galway. <laughs> I want to share with you a couple of things why I'm excited about being in this industry right now. And it's going to be a lot about social media and the impact that it has with, with all of us in our everyday lives. This, this is amazing to me. There are more than 7 billion people on the planet, 5.1 billion own a cell phone, but only 4.2 own a toothbrush. That's amazing to me. How about this? In some countries, there are more mobile subscriptions than there are people. I would guess maybe Ireland is one of those countries. This blew my mind. It takes 90 minutes on average for a person to respond to an email, 90 seconds to respond to a text message. You don't think mobile technology is going to make a difference? in where we're going, I think it will. If you're a fan of, of coupons, I know in the US, coupons are really big. Here, I, I don't see a, as much of a use for it. But if you're using coupons and you use it on a mobile phone, 10 times more likely to be redeemed. Or if you're doing a search on your mobile phone, you make an action within an hour. So are we using mobile phones for searching? Absolutely. There are more mobile phones on the planet than there are television sets. I know people that don't even have a TV, and they're watching everything they have, Netflix, uh, streaming, live streaming on, on iPads. This one uh, doesn't surprise me at all. 91% of all Americans have their mobile phone within reach. How many people, when they go to bed, can reach their mobile phone if it rings in the middle of the night? Raise your hand. That's 95% uh, of Ireland does the same thing. Amazing. Talk about generational. I, I, I'm, I'm one of the, this end of the generations in this room. How about the, the newer generations, the first years and the younger ones? Four out of five teenagers carry a wireless device. 57% view their cell phones as the key to their social life. They make plans on their mobile phone. 
They cancel plans on their mobile phone. They search for places to go on the mobile phone. It's amazing where these mobile phones are taking us. According to Facebook, there are more than 350 million active users. That's underlying the word active. 44%. And they're, they're using their mobile phones to get on Facebook. How many people have logged in today on their mobile phone on Facebook to, to post something? I did. John did. A couple other people. It's happening all over the place. And this one, the Yankee group, globally, M payments, $240 billion. Now, 2015, a trillion. So people are paying for services using their mobile phones. People know about Facebook. 100% or close to 100% awareness. How would you like to be a, a company with 100% awareness of your product? Or the fact that People are using more than just one social network. It can be Facebook. It can be Twitter. It can be LinkedIn. And all of those combined provide an opportunity for me as a researcher, for you as a business owner to make a difference. The average Facebook session lasts 37 minutes, 23 minutes on Twitter. You can double that for me. In fact, I have Twitter on 24 hours a day. I want to do a show of hands on this one. On average, people install 25 apps on their mobile phone, but only use 12. How many mobile phones do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up if you have more than 10 apps on your phone. 20 apps on your phone. 30 apps on your phone. 40. 50. 60. I'm in a competition with my advisor. I have 84. How many do you have? I mean, he'll count. Say. He'll tell me. He'll tell me in a minute. 84. I use maybe 20 of them, and I use them religiously. So, I've shown the power of a social network, but why am I interested in it from an exercise scientist? And this this chart or this 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 picture really sums it up. It's a picture of. A regular person going to their GP. John, how many do you have? I don't know. Too oh, many. Too many. <laughs> and this is really what happens, it, it, at least in the, in the American healthcare system. You go to your doctor, and the doctor says, you've got to lose some weight, you've got to quit smoking, you've got to move around, you've got to eat the carrots. That's what happens. But really what happens is, a year later, you go back to your GP, and it's the same story. So imagine if we could take a device, a tracking system that could help the physician from the first appointment to the second appointment. There are studies out now that suggest that if we can control obesity levels, so keep people as fat as they are, just don't get any worse, we can decrease healthcare costs significantly. And that's where the research that I'm doing is really exciting. So around the world today, one in three adults are overweight. That's alarming. This is even more alarming. One in 10 are obese. And the trend's getting worse. In fact, the World Health Organization recently just coined a new term called globesity. And I don't know if you can see it in the back, but I'm not proud to say that this is my native land, the US, 45% obese. Mexico, I saw Tony walk in. We're brothers, North Americans. Mexico, 33%. This is Chile, Australia, England, Brazil, Sweden, Norway, Japan. What do all those charts look like to you? Except one. They're increasing. Japan, 3%. It's pretty, pretty much stagnant from 1985. That's a worrying chart if you ask me. So... My goal is to help by not letting this happen, the role of evolution, by using technology and devices that you and I are using, as we saw in those first slides, every single day. 
I pulled this chart recently, this across top consumer health apps for Apple iPhone from Mobile Health News. Cardio, 16% of the apps are cardio. Diet related, 14 and a half. Stress reductions, women health, strength training, calculators, mental health, it, it goes on. There are devices out there that you can track everything and anything, and I've seen it. And it's actually quite amazing. In December of last year, there were 9,000 apps that fit this category. Apple apps. So we're not even looking at Android. These are just Apple. By July of this year, a couple of months from now, it's going to go up to 13,000 apps. Mobile apps are the way of the future. So as John mentioned, the research I'm doing now is looking at technology, and I'm looking at Twitter specifically, and exercise. So let's take a look at some of the things that, that Twitter has. It launched in 2006, about this same time, back in Austin at South by Southwest. Percentage of US population that use Twitter, 8%. Still a lot of people. New accounts created every day, almost half a million. 20 million adults using at least once a month. This number is actually up to 200 million now. 200 million tweets <coughs> sent per day. Let me, let me take a step back. Sometimes I, I, I get so excited about the topic I'm, ta I'm talking about that I realize that people may not know what I'm talking about. Does everyone know what Twitter is? You know, what's funny. If I would have asked that a year ago, half the hands would have gone up and said, I don't know what it is. A year before that, John Breslin may have known about it. David Crowley might have known about it. Antonio might have known about it. But it, 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 it's amazing to see the traction that it's gotten. 182% uh, increase over the past year in mobile use of Twitter. So what does the average Twitter person look like? She is a female, Hispanic, 20-something, who attended college, lives in a city, and makes about 30, between... Thirty or seventy-five thousand dollars. That's a lot of information that we can pull just on, on on Twitter profiles. What are they talking about on Twitter? This is this is something that, that is really exciting to me. Keeping in touch with friends, they post status updates. They're finding news. They are uh, sending out work-related information, research, and they're doing other things. Some of the other things they're doing is sharing their exercise habits. And that's where my research is coming into it. Personal posts, work posts, sharing stories and links. There are topics that are out there called pointless babble. You know, when, when Twitter first started, people said, well, I, I don't care that you just got up out of bed and, and you brushed your teeth. Twitter has changed dramatically. By the way, how many people have a Twitter account in the room? About half, uh, maybe more, 60%. Location-based services, geotagging, that, that's becoming a, a more popular. In fact, the apps that I'm looking at now, and we'll talk about it in a minute, there are five apps that I'm looking at. Nike Plus, Edamundo, RunKeeper, Daily Mile, and MyFitnessPal. And when we looked at the geotagging, we found out that there was one at a Mundo, 23% of the people that we were able to, to, to track had geolocations on it. The other apps had less than 1%. So what that told us was that Edamundo's privacy policy was opt out rather than opt in. And the other ones, it was the opposite way. And in fact, I believe Edamundo has, has changed that. And it's it, it changed because of that, because a lot of people were complaining about that they were, they were getting geolocations. Media outlets, this middle one, are by far the most active users. Many of you probably follow CNN, BBC, uh, News Talk. And it's a small subset of people that are using it. There are a lot of people that are out there. But the content of the tweets are just coming from a small set. So what we're doing, 
with the exercises, looking at, is it the same thing? Is it the same percentage of people that are going out and working out and sharing their workouts, the same numbers as it is on a bigger scale? And the answer is no. And I'll talk about that as well. Twitter around the world, Netherlands, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, we're looking at teen digits, 26% penetration rates. John, you know what it is in Ireland? I think, I'm, I'm going to guess it's probably somewhere in the teens. And it's not just the big companies that are tweeting. It's the small ones. <coughs> and it's becoming a very popular way, even for the big companies. I was talking at lunch today uh, with uh, two friends about Nike. When's the last time you saw a Nike television commercial on, on TV? <laughs> Nike has changed the way they are marketing. And they're going viral. They're going to YouTube. They're going to Facebook. And they're going to Twitter. Why? They're not selling sneakers to me anymore. They're selling the sneakers to the first year students. And where are those first year students going? They're going to Facebook, they're going to YouTube, and they're going to Twitter. So. If I had one slide to talk about my research, this is it. It's called connected health. So I'm looking at the, the, the correlations between health and technology. From a health perspective, I showed you the slide on, on globesity. My interest becomes the physical activity. So what can we do to decrease the obesity by increasing physical activity using a mobile phone and then sharing it online for Purposes of the, of the research that I'm doing, we chose Twitter because it's publicly available information. If you in the past year have tweeted a workout on one of those five apps I talked about, we have it. And we're able to, to take a look at the data set and, and get some very, very interesting numbers from that. And here's how it works. Mobile phone. It's time for me to go out for my workout. So I turn on one of the, the five, RunKeeper. This is Edamondo. RunKeeper, by the way, is out of Boston. They just signed, um, what was it, 10 million that they got on, on seed capital. Edamondo, they just got 7 million from, um, they're out of Denmark. They just opened an office up in San Francisco. My Fitness Pal, Daily Mile, and the gorilla in the room, Nike. What we're finding it is very interesting, though, is why are these companies using Twitter? Why do you think Nike's using Twitter? Sell shoes. Sell products. Uh, Runkeeper doesn't have a product to sell. They're coming up with an, an overall health graph, and they're collecting information from some of the apps I'll talk about. So if you are using the Zio sleep monitor. When you share this information online, it goes to the Zio website, but if you choose to allow it, it'll also go to RunKeeper. So now I have a snapshot of how much I slept, how much I exercised. I've got a scale. The, the, you know, when I talk about this scale, it's funny. The men in the room kind of like, hey, that's pretty cool. I'd use that. The women in the room say there's no way that I would ever use this scale. It tweets my weight. I stand on every morning, every Monday morning, once a week, and it tweets my weight. Why do I do it? Accountability. I keep accountability to myself and to all the people that follow me on, on Twitter. So you turn the mobile fitness app on, and then you go out and you do what I call the ING activities, walking, running, swimming, but I don't recommend taking your iPhone into the, into the bay. It gets a little... Uh, waterlogged. And then at the end of the workout, you save it. And you can see this is my prom workout. So I, I go in, come back out. It gives me a nice description. These are in miles. I still haven't got the conversion to kilometers yet. So miles, elevation. This is pretty interesting. But to me, the really interesting part is this page. This is my profile page on RunKeeper. And this is where I believe a lot of the sharing of social networking is taking place, on the page itself. 
you can see these are my April of last year, my walks. And you can see my distance, my duration, my pace, my average speed. This technology, those of you that were here, was it last week or the week before uh, when we talked about the athletes having all these tools? He's absolutely right. They've had these tools for years. Now, with technology, we've been able to break it down so you and I can use the same technology that they're using. But here's the key. It's the sharing of this information on Twitter and Facebook, if you choose to allow it to happen. And that's the basis of the research that I'm doing. So for the past year, we've collected tweets. We've, uh, I, I just checked this morning. We have a database of 8 million tweets. Of the five apps that I've talked about, 3.5 million tweets. I first suggested to John that I was going to go through and manually determine what each tweet meant. 3.5 million, I think we figured out it would take something like two years to do if I worked 40 hours a week doing it. So John suggested we use technology and come up with a, a, a classification system. And we did that. And it classified about 80% of the tweets. And then the other 20% we've been able to, to go through, some by hand, some by some other methods, to, to go through and to categorize these tweets. And we've categorized them into one of three categories. And this is it. So it's the Vicki Breslin fitness tweet classification model. And we have found that of all these eight and a half million tweets, it's either one of three main categories. It's either an activity. I want, you know, I'm in Ireland. I had to be a B. I want A, B, C. So Blarney fit the, fit the role. So it's either activity, Blarney, or conversation. And then there are subcategories. So an activity can be a workout. So the one that I just showed you from RunKeeper, that's a workout. A workout plus is if I were to, to, to tweet that, but I added some additional text. So I just walked two miles with RunKeeper, and it was a rainy day. Or, and I worked out with David. To me, if you're going to add things to the back end of a tweet, that's an intent of engagement. So I wanted to be able to differentiate between the two. Pointless babble, you know, those are some of the things that they're great on Twitter. I don't want them part of the research, so we, we created a category. Spam, we found out that RunKeeper, there was somebody that was tweeting. So every time that someone posted on Twitter, they were getting a tweet back. So there are about 95,000 spam tweets in, 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 the, in the context of RunKeeper. Wouldn't have known it otherwise. So I, I, in fact, before we figured this out, I was surprised that RunKeeper was having more tweets than Nike. And I couldn't understand why. And then found out that it was this guy tweeting so much. And then conversation. So conversation is people that are adding the hashtags of, of RunKeeper. And we've decided it's one of four. It's either technical support. So people are on there saying, my RunKeeper is broken. Please help me fix it. And there's someone at RunKeeper that's replying to the tweets. And they're fixing Corporate marketing. The reason I know that RunKeeper just signed that big venture capital deal was because they tweeted about it. And then it got retweeted. Statements of support. So if David tweets out on his RunKeeper that he just got his personal best, and I reply to him saying, David, good job, keep it up, that's a statement of support. There is an intent for me to help David. So think back in my, in my earlier days of, of a fitness center, and the four walls of the fitness center. What this is allowing is to break down those walls. So I don't need to be in Washington, D.C. to train one of my clients. I could be anywhere in the world, and that's what this is allowing it to happen. And then information sharing. There, there are just things that are on there that are, that are being shared between people. So the first part of the research has been 184 days, 2.8 million tweets. I broke that down into 1.9 million English tweets with 112 unique users. So I've got a pretty robust data set. And right now, we, we, it's still collecting, but for the purposes of the, of the paper and, and of, uh, of my PhD, we, we've stopped it. Otherwise, it just becomes too much. So this is a chart that you may be familiar with. It's the Rogers Diffusion of Innovation. And the reason I put this one up here now is because I think where we are now is here, early adopters. 
I, I'm probably over here. I'm one, I'm one of the ones that um, if there's a new fitness gadget out, I probably have it. I like playing with it, and I try to break it. But imagine when we get an early majority and a late majority of people sharing their exercises online. And let's be quite honest. There are people that are very, very concerned with sharing things online. I understand that. It's not right. It's not wrong. I'm just researching and trying to find out why. Because imagine if we can create a better tool, a better way for someone to share online. Some of you are familiar with Weight Watchers. What's the basis of Weight Watchers? It's people coming together, being accountable, because you come to the front of the room, you weigh yourself. Some people share it, some people don't. That's fine. But it's the accountability of that group. But Weight Watchers happens together. Let's eliminate that. Let's have Weight Watchers so if my father and I want to have a challenge together on going out and walking 10,000 steps a day, that we can do it online. So I could be in Galway, and he could be in Pennsylvania, and I can still impact his health. A friend of mine, Bruno Azizi from Microsoft, came up with this acronym when he talks about technology and health. There are five things that he believes. First thing, it has to be affordable. One of the challenges that we had with the athletes was it cost too much. You know, for a device to be able to mount and measure these things, it was $10,000. Where's some of my third year students? That vest that we just got, how much was that vest? Where are my third years? Uh, they're doing push-ups. Fourth years. You know that vest I'm talking about? So we got a vest downstairs in the um, performance lab. And, and was it, it's about 60,000 euros, right? 60,000 euros. And you wear the vest, and it's got sensors on it so you can do movements. They, they use it for gaming, but they're also using it for some of the, we use it for the rowing and some of the other things. $60,000 for that technology. So the guy sitting in the back of the room that builds sensors right now, and I bet you... He'd love to have $60,000 and could build you something equally as good. So the cost is coming down. The second thing is it's holistic. What's holistic mean? It means it's not just fitness, exercise. It's not just nutrition. It's everything. It's sleep. There's a tracker. In fact, the, the, the speaker's coming in Dublin in June to talk about it. He created an app called Mappiness. He did it in London, and he would send messages out to people off on the app and say, how do you feel? And people would rank how they felt, and then he would ask other questions. Where are you? Are you at home? Are you at work? Are you on the subway? Are you in a bus? Then he asked, who are you with? Family, friends. So he has this huge data collection now, and the, the British government is designing and funding different aspects of health investment based on this app that he's got. So he's speaking in June. Approachable. What's approachable really mean? It means it's got to be easy to use. And when, when I wrote my first book, my goal was I want my father to understand this. So it's got to be approachable. It's got to be easy to use. It's got to be a couple of clicks. So if you're checking into something, you know what the buttons are and you click the button and you can check in. Automatic. Let's go back and think about the RunKeeper example. I allow RunKeeper to post to Facebook and to Twitter. That's it. That's all I have to do. If I want to change that, it's very simple to click a button and to change that. But it makes it automatic. Because if I had to go in every time I was done with my workout, do you think I would do it? No. And I'm one of the early adopters. So we need to make it easy for the general masses. And then the fifth piece, it's shareable. If you think back, and those of you that remember workout cards, this was my pet peeve when I was at the White House. We had workout cards. We give them out to people when they come in, they start exercising. And what would happen? They would track for the entire year that they did 25 push-ups. Never went up, never went down. But we had so many people that we had to deal with, and we had so few people on staff, we couldn't go through the workout cards on a daily basis. But imagine now if the workout card was on an iPad or a mobile phone. 
And I then can set up automatic triggers to know when a person is doing the push-ups that they're supposed to do, or to remind a person to go out and to do the activities. Or take, for example, when the staff that I had at the White House would travel to Ireland for two weeks to do pre-advance when the president would come visit, and they lost that opportunity to exercise. And I could mobily interact with the person and maintain their exercise. So when they came back to Washington, they didn't fall off their plateau, and they maintained their exercise habit. And the sixth one is one that I put in there, and that's persuasive. So we have to be more persuasive in the designs of what we're doing. I'm gonna, my third years that aren't here, this might be on their exam, so no one tell them. And you didn't see that on TV either. Don't tell them. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the apps that I found and some of the movements that are out there. The first one is called Quantified Self. Uh, you want to talk about a group of technology folks that are really measuring everything? It's this group. I had the opportunity last year to go to San Francisco for their first conference. They have Quantified Self groups in Dublin. They just had a big event in Amsterdam and has grown dramatically. These people are tracking everything from everything they put into the body to everything that comes out of the body to every step that they take to every minute of sleep. It's an amazing, amazing group to be involved with. This is the website. You can see over here on this side, some of the, this is March 13th. So they had an event in Munich in the Bay Area in San Francisco, Philadelphia. I'm guessing that's German, MIT. But the reason I put the slide up there is this one right here. They have created a guide to over 400 apps, tools, quantified self tools, where you can measure everything. Over on this side, Android, energy. This is the fitness. So these are all fitness. Uh, Goal-oriented, mood, lifestyle, learning, networks, relationships, sleep from free to $100. If you're interested in this industry, this is the website you should go to. And then they give you a little description of, of the uh, apps that are available. And then, of course, they have the ability where you can interact. Gary Wolf is the founder, by the way. He, um, he's, he was a writer for Wired Magazine, and this is his new passion, Quantified Self. One of the things that you can also do is to uh, post different stories. This was a post that I, I did, what was that, back, uh, back in May. And uh, I didn't know this at the time, but it, it's still the mo one of the most popular posts on Quantified Self. And I did an analysis between the Fitbit, which is this little device, monitors every step that I take during the day. Uh, the people in my unit kind of laugh at me. I'm a walking experiment because I have a Fitbit on. This one here, this is a jaw, jawbone. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is called the body media. I wore this device for a year, actually for 13 months, on my arm. Interestingly enough, when I was coming back from Christmas this year, I went through TSA security. I had that on. Went right through. What's that tell you? So let's look at some of the apps, some of the devices that are out there. This is the body media. This was the device that you wear on your arm. It is, I think last I saw, about $150. It measures everything. Um, they've got algorithms that, that, that break out. And I actually did an analysis. When I got on the plane in Shannon and I landed in Newark, I saw it, you know, was the turbulence, did that check off as, a, as motion? No, it's smart enough to know the difference. Good device. Uh, the price point, like I said, 150, and then it's about $10 a month to be able to go on the website and, and to interact. So from a price point, mm, it's probably one of the higher gold standards in terms of accuracy, but for the general masses, there might be some other devices that you would like. You can break it down into different levels. Fourth years, we talked about this last year. What's a MET? What's one MET? 
you got to have to repeat. One met. You're, you're expending one met right now. Sitting in a chair is one met. The energy it takes for you to sit in a chair, staying awake, listening to me babble. That's one met. So you can monitor, you can monitor moderate activity, vigorous activity, and see it track over time. Second one is my zeal. This is the one that I, uh, I showed you here. In fact, I'll pass this one around. Nice catch. I told you I'm a walking laboratory. I wear that at night, every night. And it pulls it into my alarm clock. A couple of things happen. First thing I like is my alarm in the morning, let's say it's set for 8.30. It may ring at 8.30, but it may ring at 8.15. Why? Because there are studies that suggest if you wake up when you're when your dream cycle is at a certain level, you're more refreshed during the day. That device knows it, and it wakes me up at the most opportune time during the day. They just came out with this. So the problem I have was when I travel, I don't want to carry that in my briefcase. So this new device now is connected to my iPhone. Very, very powerful. It gives a, a Z score, a sleep score. It's also smart enough to know what level of sleep I'm in, how long it took me to fall asleep. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I like this so much is I, I've had sleep problems for, for my whole life. I was born with a cleft lip, so I, I have internal structure problems. So a couple of years ago, they diagnosed me, and I, I take sleeping pills, and I want to get off my sleeping pills. What this has allowed me to do was for me to track how long it takes me to fall asleep, and I keep on the side of my, my nightstand the doses of the medication that I took. So now I can wean myself off the medication and see how long it took me to sleep, but then the next day I know how awake I am because of using this device. By the way, all these devices, they have that caveat, this is not a medical device, so consult your physician. I'll use the same caveat, consult your physician or GP before you do any of it. But here's a uh, snapshot. So my scores. So it measures, it takes a, through an algorithm, collects all the information, and gives a score of, of how I slept. This one here. I didn't sleep well at all. Fitbit. That's the one I told you about. This is a new one that just came out. It's called the Ultra. This one is about a year old. Is that right, David? What the Ultra does is it help, it, well, it also will monitor going upstairs. This one does not. This is more of a linear. Um, you have one too. Do you like it? That's the Ultra one. Um, there was an article that I just posted. By the way, I'll, I'll give you this website. If you want to follow my research, it's socialfitphd.com. Socialfitphd.com. And there was an article that was just brought, uh, that was pointed out, you know, Nike has just released a new band. It's called the Nike Fuel. I think it's going to revolutionary, be revolutionary when it comes to these devices. Because, let's face it, Nike's got millions, if not billions of dollars to invest in this. This is the jawbone up. They've had production problems with this. I'm going to pass these around, but remember, if, uh, if you take any steps... It's going to count towards me. Um, the Fitbit, one of the, one of the challenges I see is it, it's got to be somewhere on you. It's got to be in a pocket. Um, whereas if you wear the jawbone or, or the bracelet like the, the Nike Fuel Band, uh, it, it's always on. But I love the device because it tells you exactly the number of steps that you take. So what I do at lunchtime, I click the button, it tells me how many steps I took today. Whereas the jawbone, I have to plug it into my iPhone to be able to see my data. This is the jawbone that I was talking about. It's, uh, it's really an app. Um, in fact, you have to use a, a mobile fitness device to be able to, a mobile device to be able to pull the data. Whoever has that, um, the jawbone, pull the, you pull the cap off, and it, it's not a USB, but it goes into the headset of your, uh, of your mobile device. 
As I mentioned, they're having some production problems. The accuracy, uh, David and I are doing some accuracy studies now, and, and I'm finding that it's about 20 to 40 percent less in terms of steps. Uh, to me, that is a step. I don't understand how you can make the difference. If Fitbit says this is a step, then Jawbone should say that is a step, but it's not the case. So we're going to find out a little bit more information and, and find out why that is. RunKeeper, one of the apps that I'm talking about, uh, a nice app. It converts to um, the metric system, so you don't have to use miles per hour or, or kilometers. I like the, um, the mapping capabilities. If you're going to use this, uh, you know, some people are, are weary of the fact that they're sending out the maps of their running routes so people could track them. That's true. You can choose not to share the map. Um, Somebody told me once, well, if you post that you go out for a run and you're here and you're gone for an hour, then someone could come rob your house while you're not home. It's true. I don't think anyone's following me that closely. But, um, you know, there's a lot of information that's being posted online that, that people can use. So you got to be smart when you share some of these things online. I think if somebody saw you going into supermarkets, they'd probably uh, do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. I like RunKeeper. Uh, I like Edamundo. They're great apps to use. Um, but like we talked about, the sharing part of it is, is the important part. And here's, a, here's one of the tweets that came up. RunKeeper, this is from RunKeeper. A user just emailed me to, t to, email to tell us that he started running July 2nd with a one and a half mile run. Since then, he's lost over 44 pounds and completed a half marathon. And... Uh, this was a couple of months later. That's accountability. That's what's missing, even in the fitness centers. It's the accountability of being able to, to see those measures. Meal snap. Oh, I like this one. Before me, I have a Big Mac, fries, and a drink. With meal snap, I take a picture of it. It sends it up to the cloud somewhere. And then within five minutes, it comes back and says, you are about to eat 1,200 calories. Is it accurate? Mm, maybe not. But there have been studies that suggest that just the simple fact of you taking a picture of what you're going to eat, you're going to eat less. Anyone in the room ever have done meal tracking before? I have. It's a pain in the arse. Thank you. But imagine if you took a picture of what you ate and kept a track that way or a log and then took that into your nutrition and said, here's what I've been eating. So it, it's $2.99. Uh, it's kind of gimmicky, but I like it. I took a picture of a pint of Guinness the other night. It was accurate. By the time it came back, the pint was gone, but that's a different story. Uh, gain Fitness. I remember I talked about the workout cards and static workout cards. This app replaces that. This is a mobile app that you can use that's a workout card electronically. So you can decide, what does that say? I think it says minutes. Home or gym, what's your fitness goal? What workout type do you have? There's even a button here somewhere that says, what, what equipment do you have? I use rubber bands, these big rubber bands, and it has workouts in there. But what it also has is descriptions of how to use the pieces of equipment. It has what muscle groups you're activating by doing that exercise. And then it tracks. So I'm doing two sets, 12 repetitions, how much weight. Great app. Uh, the founder is one of the former Google guys. So uh, he's based out in Mountain View. I like it. This one here. Anyone use Foursquare? <coughs> Foursquare is a, a, a check-in location. These guys, in fact, they're in the room here tonight. They're, it's a Dublin startup company. They are going to create an app that allows you to check in for health. So you eat five fruits and vegetables today, you check in, you get points. You slept eight hours at, at last night, you check in, you get points. 
The next phase is going to allow people to share that information. So if I'm on a goal to drink eight glasses of water a day, and John has the same goal, when John checks in and he does it, guess what? Probably means that I'm going to check in and do the same thing because I don't want John to beat me in my water challenge. So that's the, the, the small part. Imagine if we expand this to the corporate market. So you've got the HR department versus the accounting department and creating challenges around that. I like this app. They're going places. Zombie Run Game. Have you heard of this? I downloaded it. It's $7, so it's a little expensive. But it's a virtual reality game. And it doesn't matter where you are. It could be Galway. It could be London. It is based in London. But you go for a run, and you go to different mile markers, or different, it doesn't have to be miles, it could be kilometers, whatever. And you get points for going a certain distance. And let's say, for example, you slow down. Well, you start to hear zombies behind you coming to eat you. And at the end of your run, you're given so many points, and you can share your points with your friends. So Liam and I are, are, are partners in this zombie game, and I see that he wasn't able to go out and run today. I can give him some fitness points so the zombies don't get him. There's a whole new arena of, called extra gaming, and this is one of them. Uh, I like it. If you go on their website, they've got a little YouTube video that talks about it. It's interesting. It's making exercise fun, and that's part of the challenge. I talked about this. This is my scale, Withings. They're out of uh, France. How many people would use this scale, by the way? How many people would use this scale? Now, it does more than just tweet it. But what if you were able to send your weight to your GP? What if um, uh, you were a family member pregnancy and you wanted to, to monitor how much weight you're gaining over the course of the pregnancy and send it off to the GP? This is something that could allow you to do it. I'll give you a little tip, by the way. If you want to lose weight, I never recommend someone weighing themselves every day. It's too much. Your body weight changes anywhere from two to four pounds a day, just like your heart rate. So do it once a week. Do it at the same time, do it in the same environment. So I do mine as I come out of the shower, Monday mornings, after a weekend, that's my initial weight. And that's the weight I use. Nike, we talked about it. Uh, Nike, Nike and uh, Apple, you know, Steve Jobs and, and uh, Phil Knight were friends and, and they really started this partnership a couple of years ago. They're really the trendsetters when it comes to this, this mobile sensing. And they came out initially with this, uh, it's a little disc, about the size of a two, a two euro coin, maybe twice that size. And you actually put it into your shoe. So you had to have a Nike shoe to make it work. And I had a friend that worked at Nike and said, well, what if I don't have Nike? And she said, well, what you can do is you can cut the sole of your shoe on the inside and you stick it in there and it still works. So it didn't have to be a Nike shoe. But what they realized was that they can get rid of this. And of the devices that I'm monitoring, the Nike Plus, it's, it's an app that, uh, that it's allowing people to do this. Now, the, the next generation is the Nike Fuel Band. Um, I've tried for the last three weeks to buy, they're $150. They, are, you, they can't keep them on the shelves. They'll, they'll do a huge Twitter announcement. They'll say, be online at 5 o'clock to buy this. I'm online. I'm ready to hit buy at 5 o'clock. And the 15 seconds it takes to process it, they've sold thousands of them. And I can't get one. So they have done a wonderful job in not only creating a device, but creating a buzz about the device. There, uh, the, the article that I posted on, social, on my, my website, there's one about Nike Plus and how they're, they're really making changes. They're, they're putting sensors now in, in shoes. So the force that it takes to jump to do a dunk, they're going to monitor that. So imagine basketball players wanting to be able to compare themselves to Michael Jordan. And are they using the same force? The, the, I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I'm excited about this industry is some of the stuff that Nike's doing. 
so you can get miles and you know your best score and your times and same thing it's, it's got the map in fact if you go to the Nike store in Manhattan they've created a map of everyone that's run around Central Park it's a it's a it's a great piece of art uh, just based on people's movement around and that's it that's Central Park and this is something that I like. Uh, so what Nike does is it gets some of the people that they endorse. So Lance Armstrong. So you're in the midst of a run, and all of a sudden Lance's voice comes over your headset. Great job. You just got one of your personal bests. That's pretty motivating. And they've got people, you know, um, a lot of the stars that are doing that. My brother ran the DC Marathon. He used Nike Plus during his run. And when he first started the run on Facebook, he allowed it to share and it says, I'm starting my marathon. Every mile marker, it posted his time and where he was on the course. I was, it was on a Sunday, so I was probably in the office. Um, Good. Thank you. And if I hit like on Facebook, he got a cheer in his earphone. So he didn't know it was me, but it was a cheer. It was, and it was, he said it was the most motivating thing he had, knowing that people were following him online and being able to cheer. Edamundo, one of the other apps, actually has taken it one step further. So if I were to type in there, Tim, great job, keep it up, he would hear in his headphone, Tim, great job, keep it up, in one of those computer voices. Great stuff. Bluefin apps. This one is, is interesting. You know, a lot of people want to run a 5K, but they don't know where to start. There's an app that does that. You start from the couch. The goal is to be able to run a 5K at the end. And it tells you exactly what you do. Week one, day one. Week one, day two. And here's your workout. This is week one, day three. A five-minute walk, and then a run, walk, run. Easy stuff. And it works. 100 push-ups. I do this one. The goal is at the end you could do 100 push-ups straight. Is there anyone in the room that can do 100 push-ups straight right now? Other than Keith. You can? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make you do it, but we could all strive to be like him and use an app like this. So I don't have a screenshot of it. So what, what, what you do now is you do a pretest. How many push-ups can you do in a row? Let's say you can do five, that's fine. This will help you train, and it's three sets, so you might do two push-ups now, you rest a minute, you do three, you rest a minute, and you do four. And then it progresses, moves you on, so at the end of the course, you're doing 100 push-ups in a row. I like it. Oh, this is a good one. Gym pack. How many people belong to a leisure center here? Raise your hand. How many people go regularly? How many people are lying to me right now? <laughs> what this app does, or this service, you join, you set your pack, P-A-C-T. I'm going to the gym three times a week. When you're at the gym, you check in. If you're there three times, you get rewarded with cash. If you don't go three times, you lose cash. So you put, say, $10 up front, and they pay the other people with the money of the people that aren't going in. They're going to make a lot of money of people not doing it. I was mentioning earlier, one of the things that I think would be equally interesting, and I've seen it before, was let's say I'm a diehard Republican. And instead of my friend getting the money, imagine if every time I didn't keep my commitment, Barack Obama's political campaign got my money. Do you think I'd exercise more? It could work here too. Health Vault. This is Microsoft. Google Health had an account similar to this, but unfortunately over the past couple of months, they got rid of it. One of my pet peeves when I go to a new uh, physician, I mentioned you know, I was born with a cleft lip, so I, you know where it says you gotta fill out all the surgeries you've ever had in your life? Well, you know, for the younger folks, that's not bad, but 
for guys like me, and I've been around for a little bit longer, I go front and back of the sheet of paper. And I know they're not going to look at it. So what I've done was I spent a day, and I wrote every single surgery I've ever had into the health vault. I have, uh, in, in the U.S., you know, I, I track my cholesterol. And now there's a, um, one of the labs, LabCorp, I believe, syncs automatically with this. So now all of my cholesterol, I've ever done at LabCorp, gets imported into this account. My Withings scale, remember the scale that tweets my weight? Puts my weight in here. If I asked you, those of us that are already graduated from university, think back. Do you know how much you weighed your, col your college year? I mean, your senior, your, your fourth year, how much did you weigh? I, I don't remember, but I wish I, I had something like this to track it because I could, I could see d different changes. So I like this. It's Microsoft. You can share the data with your doctor. So I, uh, I actually pick my doctors down based on the fact that they accept this. I can email them. So ahead of time, they get there. They use the information. And I don't have to fill out those forms. If you're looking for an app that tracks what you eat, there are thousands of them that are out there. If you want one that does that, but also looks at what you're eating in terms of protein, carbohydrate, fat. Also to include minerals, vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D. Does this surprise anyone that since I moved to Ireland, my vitamin D levels have gone down? I take a supplement now. How did I figure that out? Through, through some of these apps that I've, I've been able to, to maintain. Um, this one, I think this one, when I bought it, it was about $7.99. But it's well worth it if you, want to, if you want to start tracking what you're eating. Uh, food Educate. Any Irish entrepreneurs out there, I think this could work here. This works now in the States by um, scanning the barcodes. And it pulls up. OK, this was a barcode for Cap uh, not Captain Crunch, but some sort of cereal. And it grades the cereal number of calories per serving. <laughs> oh, here's another cereal, Apple Jacks. It's full of sugar. It gave it a D plus, 110 calories. Put all that information simply by scanning a barcode. And correct, I, I think it's true that the barcodes here are different than, than they are back in the States, but I think it could work. Now, I can't forget about my, my students. There is an app there that measures blood alcohol. It's called Boozerlizer. One of the things I don't like about it is it's kind of making a game out of drinking. But one of the things that it does do is it gives you some, some valuable information on, um, on you know, your high score. So how much, how much does it take for you to drink to, to reach the limit where you shouldn't be out? Well, you probably shouldn't be driving anyways if you're drinking. But you know, certain levels of, of alcohol awareness. I see someone in the back downloading it now. So, I gave you an overview of my research, some of the apps that are out there. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm excited to be a professional in this industry now. I'm excited about being here at NUI Galway trying to figure this out. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have about any of these apps. Thank you very much. OK, so any questions for Ted? I am a postgrad student here, and I do uh, technology commercialization. And um, for my project, I'm looking at kids' obesity and um, how technology can help us. And reading the, the HSE's uh, kind of four-year strategy for healthcare, they mentioned technology is one of the major problems. Is there any of those apps that would be suitable for kids, specifically? Yes, and there are, you and I need to talk afterwards, yeah, and, 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 and we'll do that. So you mentioned something there, and uh, I'm, you mentioned that technology is the problem. Well, the HSE and its strategic document over four years, 
four years, 08 to 012. On the front page, signed by Bernard Drum, who used to be the chief executive of the HC. One of the problems he mentions is technology. And I kind of, having read that, one of the things that twigged me for looking at my project was, well, why is technology the problem? Why can't technology be the savior? That's the key. Yeah, so what people Why can't are, we turn that on its head? So there are a lot of people out there that are blaming technology for, you know, kid, when I was a kid, I came home from school, what I do? I was in the backyard, I was playing. So what they're saying now is with technology, kids are coming home, they're going in and they're playing, they're playing video games, or they're going in and they're surfing the web. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I, I, I commend some of these bigger companies doing with extra gaming, uh, what, the Wii, uh, who makes that? Nintendo. Nintendo Wii, um, they're getting people out, and they're not getting them out, they're, they're create right there in the room where, where you're watching or playing these games, getting people more active, and they're making it fun. Um, you know, we, we, were, we were thinking about, I don't know, the, the Fitbit. We were going to try to get some of the schools here to, to wear the Fitbit uh, because it's probably terrible to say this, my generation, we're, we might be a lost cause with this. We might be that group where we just don't want to get any fatter, but it's the kids, and that's really where these technology things. You know, I, I'm amazed. I watched my nephew, who's 12, being able to text on his phone with his hand in his pocket, and he knows what he's texting. It's like you and I, you know, typing on a keyboard. And it's these companies that, that can relate back to that and realize that the customer, like Nike did, Who's Nike going after? The 20 year olds and the, and, the, and the shoes. So I agree with you. I think technology can be the solution. Is it part of the, it's part of the problem? Let's admit that. Is it all of the problem? No, not in my opinion. But it can be a solution. So let's talk afterwards. Yes, sir. Just wonder what you, you know, in terms of, um, <clears throat> the main sort of psychological driver that, that all this <clears throat> sort of taps into. I mean, people have different motivations for exercise and different obstacles to overcome in, in adherence. So, so is this around the sort of the name and shame psychology or is it around the community aspect of it, you know, buddies running together? Or what, what, do you, what have you learned about what the main psychological, exercise psychological drivers involved? I think it's a little of both. One of the areas that I'm looking at, and there's a whole psychology, and, and I'll defer to the audience, you might know a little bit more about it than I do at the moment, of user gratification. And I think that's what you're talking about. Why are use, what gratification does a user get by using a run keeper and sharing their workouts? I think there's a couple of things. I'm a former athlete. I am competitive like the next person. I know if my brother is out there using a run keeper, and I see on Facebook that he ran two miles, and I came home from work and I'm sitting there watching TV, it motivates me to go out and to do something. I think that's part of it. I think that there is this group mentality, and I take Weight Watchers as that example again, where if we have a common goal, so if it's the, the, the seven of us here at the front and we all have that goal and I might be falling behind and I turn to you for support, and that might be a simple email, hey, I didn't see you went out for a run today. Um, I, I think there's some power in that as well. Uh, and there is some shame to it. Um, although I, I'm, you know, what is that, carrot and the stick? I'm more of a carrot guy. I, you know, hit, hitting someone over a stick saying, yeah, you lazy ass, you didn't go out and work out today? I don't think it works. It's never worked without technology. It's not going to work now. When you look at the various products that are out there, because there are a lot now in this space, you, you know, you have a sample of a couple of them there. What is it that differentiates the good ones from the bad ones? Because they all seem to be or appear to be basic accelerometers, so they're just they're measuring movement. Is it the user interface? Is it the, the design of them? Is it the... People are probably not that bothered about accuracy because, you know, they're plus or minus 10%. It's a guide. It doesn't really matter. It's not like GPS, so it's not the elites that are using them. It's kind of everyday people. So what is it you feel the point of differentiation is that kind of separates the good ones from the ones that are... Is it the user interface or what is it? You know, that's a good question. And, and, and go back to one of the comments I made earlier. I, I'm an early adopter, so for me, uh, I want to figure out how these things work. There might be a couple of us that are walking around with three devices comparing them, but the inaccuracy 
really becomes moot if the only device you're using is a Fitbit or a Jawbone. You're going to be inaccurate no matter what you do. So just, it's like, um, when I was at the, at the White House, for example, we had a scale in the, in the locker room. And someone would come in and say, you know, I've gained 10 pounds. And I found out that they were weighing themselves at home and then coming in and using the scale at the White House. And someone was actually, the, you know those, the, the scales you have with the little lever like this? Someone took a coin and adjusted it so he weighed less. <laughs> and it threw off everyone else's weight. So, you, you, so my point was, if you're using the same scale, it doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. But a couple of things. You've got those in front of you now. The jawbone. I like the jawbone. I think the jawbone from a, from a sleek, it, it's, it's sexy. I mean, I've, had, I've been wearing it. People thought it was a, it was a piece of jewelry. Uh, well, they've been, they claim that it doesn't work. They, they, they're offering 100% refund. Actually, 200% uh, because I filled one out and the, the person that gave it to me filled it out. And we both got a, a refund on it. Yeah, they said keep it. And if it doesn't work, they'll send you a new one. Um, and Jawbone has, I don't, you know, they're, they're, they're known for their headsets, and they've got a lot of money. And I, my personal opinion was I, I think that they tried to rush that out before the Nike fuel band hit, and they probably ran into some production errors. But the thing I don't like about Jawbone is if I want the data, it's not easy. i got to plug it in, which means i got to have my phone with me. But the, the studies suggest that 91% of us have that you know, the phone next to you, but it's an extra step. I've got to plug it in and I got it. Fitness has to be easy. Remember that it was simplistic. That's not simple to me. I got to log in. The Fitbit I love. I love the Fitbit because I can look at it and I can see where I am, but I don't always have it on. I mean, if I go out, um, I'm a basketball referee. I don't want to have anything in my pockets, but you know what? When I'm running, I, I refereed last night and I took 5,000 steps. I know that because I had that in my pocket. Um, so if, and I know Fitbit's doing a lot of, of um, development, and I wouldn't be surprised if they came out with a device. But I agree with you. It's the user interface. It's got to be easy. Go back to that slide I had that uh, Bruno put up. By the way, these slides I'm going to put up on SlideShare. So those of you that are familiar, uh, just search for my name right there. Um, I'll try to have them up tomorrow. And the other thing, I tell my third years and my fourth years this, LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, I strongly suggest that you get on it. I'm a big supporter of LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me there, and I can help out. But you're right. I think it's the user interface. Um, you, you can see that with, with the Edamundos and the Runkeepers and some of these other devices. Can we take one more question, then we might finish up, because I know it kind of... Uh, I'll stick around, around so can 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 afterwards, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, just in your own opinion, um, any ideas around why um, Microsoft's health vault continues to exist and Google Health failed? I wish uh, Tony had stayed because uh, Tony and I have had these conversations about it. Uh, I think Microsoft sees a value in Health Vault. Um, they're they're big enough where they can where they can make it happen. I, I think. I don't think Google got rid of Health Vault because of Health Vault. I think Google did an analysis across the board and saw all of these different products. Like think about, remember Google Wave, which lasted maybe a couple of weeks? Um, but they, they just decided to go in a different direction. So I don't think that Google Health was bad. I liked Google Health. I used it before I used Microsoft Health Vault, but I transferred all my, all my data over. So um, I like, I wouldn't want my information like that to be held by one of my insurers. You know, I, it's different here, but in the U.S., uh, you know, wh wh whoever hires you, they give you the health insurance. So if you switch jobs, you got to switch health insurance. So it's not like here where you know I've got a Viva. It's up to me who, who I choose for my health insurance. But I like somebody that it, a third party that can control my data. It's still my data, um, but I, I think that's that's one of the reasons why. And Microsoft can pull it off. And they've got all the privacy, and, and they know all the, all the things that need to be done. You, know, you also got to compare in the US, there, there's a regulation called HIPAA. So you can't share certain pieces of information if you're a physician and a patient. And there's a lot of compliance issues with it. But thanks for staying. Uh, those of you that came late, 10 push-ups for every minute that you were late. We, uh, we have a camera, so we know who you were. And I'll be tracking it with one of the sensors. I'll be here afterwards. Thank you much.